Okay, I'm going to ask people to come back together as a large group. So when thinking about assessment as a catalyst for change of education and the healthcare system, I'm going to start with the first question of how does, how does assessment, um, what, what possibilities and promises there for assessment to change education? So I, I will be provocative here and say the Good. question's wrong. <laughs> uh, the two questions should be asked together. And, and we continue to dichotomize this as if they're two different worlds and perpetuate the two different worlds. In fact, health professions, education, and healthcare delivery are one world with one goal. And we should be thinking about the impact of assessment on both of them simultaneously and impact of our changes on both of them simultaneously that the educational changes are informed by the delivery changes, and the delivery changes are informed by the education changes. So I would reformulate it as, as, as impact on both uh, and not see them as two different worlds. So I can see now that I should have actually called on you last because, <laughs> because we actually knew in designing the questions that there was going to be a tremendous amount of overlap. And if not, it would beg the question, why isn't there overlap between change, you know, the catalyst for change in both. So, so we, were, we were setting you up. So I should have called on you last, but you kicked us off exactly where we need to be. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add? So now that we've blended questions three and four, That's right. <laughs> we, we talked a lot about both the strengths and the vulnerabilities of, of clinical education that is, in, in the case of pharmacy, um, very dependent upon volunteer uh, instructors, preceptors. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that that has the potential to introduce meaningful changes in their practice, but it also doesn't always work quite that well. Um, and so we really owe it to the academic enterprise and to our students to figure out how to strengthen um, those relationships and um, the assessment within those activities uh, and preceptor preparation. Excellent point. Another player in our interprofessional team for sure. Yes. We also talked about the learner being not just a student. The practitioners are continuous learners as we talk about the continuous quality improvement systems within the healthcare systems. It's really important to also be able to assess how practitioners are continuing to make changes. Excellent point. One of the things that we talked about in our planning group over and over again was the, the just language. Um, and so we had conversations about, you know, we started out with student and faculty and then we had the conversation about, well, all students are learners and teachers, and faculty should be both as well. <laughs> One of the other things we talked about was in order to reap the possible uh, improvement effect on health professions education, there needs to be a periodic, at least annually, look at all of the assessments that you're, learn that you're using, look at them for alignment with educational goals, and then look at the level of student achievement if you're thinking about summative assessments. Are they actually learning what are your educational goals? And if not, figure out where the problems are. So building in time for reflection, which is what we were talking about earlier for the learner, but really also for the teachers. Yes. I just want to take us back to a very fundamental part of this question. Uh, you know, how can assessment be used to drive change? I think one of the things that's really important is to make sure that you create a culture where you embed the idea that assessment drives change. Think about the, the why before we think about the how. And you know, those of us who deal in the education world know that classic sort of cycle of assessment discussion where you design your learning outcomes, you design your metrics on how you're going to measure them, you design your tool, you gather your data, and you analyze your data. And the problem is, so often we forget the last step, which is you take what you learn to drive change, and then you go back around the cycle again. If you don't embed assessment in the academic culture of the place, you can develop all the tools you want. It just will never happen. 
That's an excellent point. I've seen too often where we spend much more time in the um, selection of measurement and gathering the data and so forth, and we're exhausted by the end, and we don't really use the data to have the rich conversation, which is what assessment needs to be about. We also talked about the issue of embedding a culture of assessment um, as uh, influencing potential changes on the healthcare system. Uh, specifically, we talked about the role of self-assessment and training individuals to be good self-assessors and giving them the expectancy that this would be a lifelong process, that they'd continue to evaluate their skills as they leave the educational institutions and go into practice settings. And we also talked about uh, the idea of just the culture having frequent formative assessments being normative as part of the process, and that there's feedback to those who provide feedback to st students so they understand how effective uh, they are in, in giving that uh, messages. Um, we talked, interestingly, to, to the point made earlier at the start of this discussion, is that it would be important to engage healthcare systems in understanding what types of assessments the educational programs are using so we could have that interface and have opportunities to have a bi-directional um, kind of impact on that. Um, and also the, the importance of perhaps engaging patients in the, the, the design of uh, feedback uh, to students as well. So the piece about engaging the, the, the institutions, the organizations, the settings links back to what Lucinda said in terms of we have a, a, a way into that world through our volunteer preceptors, supervisors, you know, all, all of our professions have that and, and really capitalizing on that relationship. And also as a way to support practice. I mean, practice isn't struggling just because they're out of touch. They're struggling for some very um, significant reasons as well, and that's a way that we could really, as educational programs, support practice. Well, this re reflects some of what we were talking at, about here. I was depressed to hear Eric's comment that we need to only put our learners in good places, because guess what? There aren't enough of those good places for us to put them in. And so I think our challenge is to figure out how we bring in the practice world to be a part of shaping and forming what we do in the education experience and then hopefully having that transfer back and forth about what happens to try and create better systems. If uh, we live in bad systems and just pass through them, we deserve being a victim of what goes on there. Hmm. Excellent point. Sure. We, um, we kind of talk about a little different here in this afternoon and when we're going to hit things from a policy level, a meso level, or institutional, and an individual level. One of the discussions we had is that with the high stakes exams, that so many of the high stakes exams for all of our professions are really just about the content, more the clinical content, but under the rubric of safety, going back to the, the connection with patient safety, that perhaps there needs to be a an overall licensure level exam because students are going to study to the exam regardless of what that is in every profession. If it's not there, then they're not going to be focused on it. And so is there an overall licensure exam around communication and some of the areas that we're talking about that crosses professions and then could that then be applied as a formative going forward in terms of when we just think about levels of learning and um, really just thinking about how it comes back to the institution. But we think there's probably, or uh, members of our table think that there's probably a policy perspective because if you don't change that ultimate outcome, we're not going to change the, the way that people are teaching. They're going to continue to teach. And students are going to continue to study to what they think they have to pass to be able to practice. Very provocative idea. And to piggyback on that, it's, it helps um, embrace the social mission, the diversity, and it helps put it forefront to push change mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. move it forward. Mm -hmm. Excellent. There you go. Just to, to, um, to do a double piggyback there, um, we were talking a little bit about more of the universities as being the conduit for what the students are reflecting on during the assessments, knowing that they're faced with challenges and resource constraints in the communities. 
making sure that universities take advantage of their position as conduits to policymakers and letting them know what the challenges that their students and their learners are seeing in the healthcare systems to better effectuate change. Um, so making sure that that conversation is happening across policy levels, using the information from those assessments and bringing it, bringing it up, hoping to effectuate change back down again. Um, I've been thinking, and it came up a little bit in discussion at our table, about backing up from the assessment process and saying, what is it are we assessing? And the nature of the assignments that we then want to assess can pull practice and education closer together. Mm -hmm. And the example I think of is, is teaching quality improvement skills mm -hmm. and knowing that students gain experience in clinical settings where they are observers and maybe an actors of particular uh, norms, uh, ways of practicing in a system. And they come up with ways that the system may be improved. And so the question is, is that feedback going to be um, sought and accepted and dialogued around by the systems themselves? So that you, by the nature of your assignments, embedding them in, in if, if the goal is about systems change, then the interaction between systems and educators has to be one of dialogue and integration. So how can students learn to do better at QI and how can systems benefit from those students and their learning? It's a burden to place that on students, but they're, they're in that key role. But it gets back again to our discussion of power and where yes, students exist exactly. in that power hierarchy. Yeah. Beverly? Yeah. Okay. I, and I know this has been said, so I'm really doing a ditto here, but um, <laughs> inadequate, in, uh, bad systems that students get placed in and inadequate products that we prepare so, you know, I want both of those to sort of resonate, sort of like a song together, because they're not, it's not one or the other. Sometimes it's both, and the patient is the in recipient of it. And that it's, and we can't, we, I think as an educator, we have to watch our language about how we talk about practice, because it, it's as if it's the bad place, and we're the good guys bringing in this great product. Yes. So, you know, we, I, I just think there's got to be this mellowing of that it's a mutual situation here and that we both are, both education and practice are struggling to do it to the best of our abilities and, so, and we, we've not got it quite right yet. Excellent. Excellent. In the back. Uh, going further on that uh, point, I think that academic institutions have to, will have to make choices in order to see to what kind of environment and context are we going to expose our students? And we know that this exposure is very important. If we are faced with social inequalities in health, well, we have to make deliberate choices, not outside the curriculum, but inside the curriculum, to expose students to those contexts and environments where they can be confronted with people living in those conditions. And there was a very interesting, uh, I think, um, editorial in the BMJ of the 13th of June, where it was uh, described by Agerty from uh, Canada that probably the fact that doctors are mostly in the higher social classes, but the fact that they are able to communicate with people from between brackets lower social classes uh, brings them in those people into a situation of lifting them up on the social scale so that they feel respected, that they feel valued, and that probably that could be one of the reasons why systems that have a good primary care uh, system, a strong primary care service towards uh, those people in need, that they contribute to uh, decreasing social inequalities in health. And I think it's a very interesting hypothesis, the social uplifting role of uh, healthcare providers. And so we should train uh, our physicians to be exposed to those contexts and to really learn in those contexts because they really can make, I think, a big difference. Absolutely. I'm going to have one more. Hi, I'm a graduate, I'm a graduate student studying speech language pathology. 
And our table discussed how important it is to work as a team. And I feel if I'm placed in an environment that I'm not used to because of the cultural differences and our um, clinical experiences want us to be exposed to a different as many environments as possible. If you work in a team, then you're going to be supported by other professionals, even if you're working with someone who is not a speech pathologist, maybe the occupational therapist or the doctor if you're in a, in a certain hospital. If they're supporting you and agreeing with what you're doing and helping you help the patient achieve their goals, then you're going to want to stay in that environment no matter how difficult and challenging it is. So I feel that if you're receiving support from all different professionals, then no matter what environment you're placed in, you're going to be happy to be there. Thank you. This, is, this has been such a rich discussion, and we're definitely giving you more time to dig even deeper into some of these issues after lunch. But we wanted to make sure that we close the morning with some very specific and concrete examples, some exemplars, so to speak, of, of assessment. And I'm going to be turning this over to Carol Aschenbrenner, who will be moderating a panel for us.